Live from the 3ABN Worship Center, welcome to the Pillars of Prophecy event. You know, we're just having a wonderful time here in West Frankfurt. You know, people say, are you in West Frankfurt or are you in Thompsonville? And you know, we're in both, where are actually. We? We're both, actually, because right. our main facility is West Frankfurt address. That's right. Then I think the church over here and part of our property is on Teville, Thompsonville. Right. But it's West Frankfurt, Thompsonville area, Franklin and, County, yeah. Illinois. And I had somebody say, are you in a church or are you in a worship center? We are in a worship center. We're in both. The Thompsonville <laughs> Church meets here on Sabbath, <laughs> but it is the 3 ABN worship center that has been paid for, not by our local church, but by you, those of you in, uh, in this uh, and, the 3 ABN audience. And yeah. we have uh, people from all around the country and outside the country here for our spring right. camp meeting. And uh, for those of you at home, uh, if you're in the driving distance area, come on out tonight. If it's too late tonight, come tomorrow. We're going to be here liter literally all day, right, from about oh, yes. 9 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. So there's plenty of time for you to come and join us. Yep. And to those of you that's here from traveled, I think some of you have traveled a few thousand miles to be here. Mm. And uh, you all been blessed so far with all the meetings and speakers. Yeah. And, okay, even including the food, I heard. Wow. Y'all enjoying that too. All yeah. right. And you know, it's amazing, but there will be something going on when you get here, no matter when you get here, <laughs> right? And uh, we do have wall-to-wall uh, -wall meetings. Uh, and uh, so it's been a wonderful blessing. And just to getting to visit with you folks has been a real blessing as well. It's amazing that almost 28 years after we were impressed to build a station to reach the world, that, that because of you and your love and prayers and financial support, the 3ABN continues to, to literally reach the world. Yes. Virtually every continent on planet Earth, people can watch 3ABN or listen to it if they really want to. And we couldn't do it without you. So thank you, those of you at home. Thank you for your love and your prayers and financial support. I'm excited. I have been about camp meeting. All of us oh, are yes. with the speakers that we have tonight. And uh, we're going to in introduce those in just a few moments. But before we do that, I know that we're going to have uh, some music. We are. And, you know, and we have a tremendous privilege here uh, of most Sabbaths having John Lomacain. Now, John also serves as the ambassador of goodwill for 3ABN. He travels around the world for us. He goes to Africa and, both, yeah. and uh, in the Philippines and Australia. Yes, but they go together, John and Angie. Uh -huh. And they're a wonderful couple. But we have a tremendous privilege of not only getting to sit at John's feet uh, and, uh, and hear him preach, but also hearing him sing. And we're going to have that opportunity right now. And he's going to sing a song for us called Much Too High a Price. All right. John? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Danny. Too high a price for me. 
your tears, your blood, the pain to have my soul just stern at times, yet never truly changed. You deserve a fiery love that won't ignore your sacrifice because you paid much too. And how true. He paid such a high price. The very God of heaven sending his son to come here to die for such as we, such as I. It, um, that's a big price. It just helps us to know how much he loves us and how much we should be completely grateful for the gift of life eternal. I'm so grateful tonight for God's leading in this movement. The Seventh-day Adventist movement is still a movement. Don't ever let anybody call us a church, a denomination. We must remain a movement moving forward around the world with the gospel, with the message. More interested in spreading that message than in building churches or empires or anything of that nature, spreading the message that Christ is coming again soon. And one of the most exciting aspects of that has, for me, been to see so many young people that God just reaches out and, and touches. Many of them have been touched through 3ABN. Many of them have been just found by God. Uh, I think of David Ashrick and uh, I think of uh, the Rosario brothers, two of which work with David 
And the third J is a pastor in California, in the San Jose area at the Cambrian Park, and he has the Los Gatos uh, churches uh, there near San Jose. You've heard Jay preach here on 3ABN many times. God has blessed him. And we pray tonight that once again he will be anointed by the Holy Spirit as he brings a message to us entitled The First Prophecy. Hello, everyone. Happy Sabbath. How's everybody doing? Have you been blessed thus far? I am very, very excited about this message, and uh, I've been very, very blessed. It seems, like, it seems like it's been crescendoing, yeah? The closer and closer we've been getting to the Sabbath, and uh, so that's exciting. Um, our message uh, this evening is entitled, The First Prophecy, and uh, we're just going to jump right in, amen? So just bow your heads with me as we invite the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this awesome, wonderful privilege you've given us to investigate and to study the most important book in the universe. And Father, we're so privileged to be amongst brothers and sisters in Christ from different places in the world. And in spite of our different cultures and different ages, Father, we're family. And we feel like we're almost like in a family reunion, coming together as fellow believers in the faith. Lord, this evening we ask that you hide me behind the cross. We have not heard, come to this particular place to hear the, the philosophy of a man. We have come here, Father, to hear the living words of God. And we ask, Father, that you may open our minds and give us new insights and new vistas to old truths that we have known intellectually but possibly that we haven't experienced. So bless us, Lord. Speak in a very, very special way is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message is the first prophecy, and it deals with the, of course, it's appropriate the, that the first prophecy would be where? In the first book of the Bible, amen? So let's, go, let's take a look at the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be going all over Scripture this evening, so make sure that your, your fingers are ready, amen? Because we're going to be going everywhere, all throughout the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and when you're there, please say a hearty amen. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy, and really it's a promise also. It's a promise and a prophecy of what God, is going, what God was going to do in the person of His seed. Now, in Genesis chapter 3 is a fascinating chapter because, of course, it talks about the fall of who? The fall of Adam and Eve. Yeah? And when you look carefully in uh, verses 6 and onward, right after they disobeyed, you actually have a, an investigation on the part of God. A what? An investigation. And right after the investigation, God pronounces judgment. Amen? In other words, the very first prophecy is nestled in an investigation that God is doing. And then right after the investigation, God is basically pronouncing judgment. If you put these two uh, dynamics together, you have what we like to call the investigative judgment. Typically speaking, the investigative judgment... Uh, uh, many people think that it comes from, from the book of Daniel uh, exclusively or it comes from the book of Revelation exclusively. But the point is that when you see the way that God begins His uh, kind of His model of pronouncing judgment, you find that the investigative judgment is found all the way back in the book of Genesis. And beginning in verse 6, uh, we're here in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam hid his wife. Oh, excuse me. And Adam and his wife hid. <laughs> Adam did not hide his wife. Amen? I just said that to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> now that I have your undivided attention. 
Adam and his wife hid themselves, excuse me, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the, the trees of the garden. Now, this is where in verse 9, God begins a sequence of questions. Okay? In the Bible, you have a fascinating uh, fact that God asks a lot of questions. In fact, they say that in the ministry of Jesus alone, Jesus asked over 150 questions in his earthly ministry. There's something about the God asking questions, right? He kind of wants to, he wants humanity to open up within their own assumptions. And the first question in verse 9, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, what is the first question? Where are you? Question, did God know where Adam was? So why in the world is he asking the question, where are you? Because he's asking a question that is requiring Adam to begin to think and to do a personal assessment. Amen? That's why he asked these questions. He, God already knows this, but maybe Adam needs to realize exactly where he is. Question number one. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, question number two, who told you that you were naked? Question number three. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? It almost seems like God, the God parent here is dealing with kind of a little rebellious child, right? Uh, some, a child that understands that they have done wrong and they, they feel very, very guilty. So you kind of have this interaction between God and Adam. So God asks Adam three questions and then he transitions. Yeah? And in verse 12, the man said... The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So what is Adam's justification for eating of the forbidden fruit? He points his finger at who? At the woman. But really, he doesn't just point the finger at the woman. He points the finger at God because he says the woman essentially that you gave me, right? So really, ultimately, God, this is your fault. Right? The blame game began in Genesis chapter 3. And when you look in verse 13, God moves from asking questions to Adam, and he asks one question to the woman. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? What is the woman's re response? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Right? So if you notice, Adam and Eve are kind of dishing off their guilt on somebody else. Adam dishes it off to the woman. The woman dishes it off to the serpent. God asks Adam three questions, and he asks Eve one question. I wonder why that is. I think that the reason why he did this is to show that ultimately... The priest of the home, amen, is who? It was Adam. It was Adam's responsibility to maintain faithfulness and integrity, not only in their marriage, but also in their home. So that's why God is asking Adam more questions. Why? Because Adam is more accountable in the, in the union of marriage. So he asks Adam three questions. He asks the woman one question, and notice... As you continue reading in verse 14, God turns to the serpents. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Did you notice what just took place? God came to Adam, asked Adam three questions. Then he went to Eve, asked Eve one question. And then he went to the serpent and asked the serpent no questions. Amen? Why? Because the serpent, God wasn't trying to negotiate with the serpent. Amen? But what we see here is that the questions begin to get fewer, fewer to the point where there is no more questions. And in verse 14, God is now basically pronouncing judgment on the serpent. And after he pronounces judgment on the serpent, he begins to pronounce judgment on Adam and Eve. 
And when you keep reading in verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, um, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Verse 17, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Interesting. Adam and Eve commit a sin. They disobey the voice of God. God comes initially to Adam. He asks three questions. Then he goes to Eve he asks one question, then he goes to the serpent, he asks no question and pronounces judgment. Then he comes back to the woman and pronounces judgment. Then he comes back to Adam and pronounces judgment. If you notice the judgment on Adam versus the judgment on Eve, which one is more lengthy? The judgment of Adam. Again, Adam was given three questions. His judgment is a little bit longer. Eve was asked one question, and her judgment is just really one text. Really what you see here is a chiasm. Anybody know what a chiasm is? Raise your hand. Chiasm is basically kind of a structure in prophecy and, in, in, and even in literature where you basically have A, B, C, B, A. They actually do that quite a bit in poetry, those of you who are avid fans of poetry, which I doubt many of you are avid fans of poetry. Amen? <laughs> At least, you know, I wasn't an avid fan of poetry when I was in school. So... What you, do, what you see here is you see God's approaching Adam. Then he approaches Eve. Then he approaches the serpent. Then he approaches Eve again. And then he finally approaches Adam. Do you see the pattern there? It's a mirror, right? It's a chiasm. And when you go through all the books of the Bible, they actually say that major portions of prophecy are, are in a chiasm structure. One of the things that many, many Bible scholars believe is that the Pentateuch, anybody know what the Pentateuch is? First five books of the Bibles, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Many theologians believe that the Pentateuch is actually based on a chiasm. And what that basically means is that the first book mirrors the last book, yeah? The second book mirrors the second to the last book. And then what you have is kind of like a ziggurat. Anybody knows what a ziggurat is? It's kind of like, a, uh, it's kind of like an Aztec temple. Uh, it's not like quite like this, but it's kind of like this. And then there's a top portion, which is kind of like the epicenter. Like that's what the main uh, point, that's what the nucleus, that's what the, the main uh, subject matter of that particular prophecy is. Yeah. And when you look at the Pentateuch, what is the middle book of that chiasm? It's the book of Leviticus. And what is Leviticus talking about? Fundamentally, what do you see over and over in the book of Leviticus? You see the word sacrifice. Right? You see lamb, you see sacrifice, lamb, sacrifice. Anybody done the, the read the Bible in one year before? Tech, typically speaking, what is the book that kind of makes it kind of rough to kind of get to finish that goal? Let's be honest. Gen generally speaking, it's the book of Leviticus, yeah? Because it is very repetitive, right? And it's very, very hard to follow. The point is that every time you see the word lamb there, who is that really referring to? is referring to, the, to, to Jesus Christ himself. So the most Christ-centered book in the entire Bible, we could even argue, is what? Is the book of Leviticus. Because you always have a reference to the lamb. You always have a reference to the sacrifice. You always have a reference to the blood. Yeah? So that is kind of a, somehow a, a chiastic structure. When you study the book of Revelation, actually, Actually, the book of Revelation is also formed in a chiastic structure, yeah? So what we're basically saying is that the first prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 is kind of laying down the principles, yeah, to knowing how to interpret the subsequent prophecies that will follow. Does that make sense? If this is the first prophecy, well, then obviously the first prophecy will give us hints as to what prophecies are really all about and how you and I can intelligently and accurately interpret every other prophecy that will come after Genesis 3.15. Does that make sense? For example, in Genesis chapter 3.15, we basically see three fundamental things. We see the word enmity. I will put enmity, yeah, between you and the woman 
between your seed and her seed. Notice that the her seed is a little different than your seed, if, depending on what translation you have. The second seed in, in Genesis 3.15 is capitalized in some Bibles. Have you noticed that? Why do you suppose it's capitalized? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's three elements here. We have the enmity elements, we have the seed elements, and we also have the you shall bruise uh, his head elements. In other words, we have to understand what the enmity point is, we have to understand what the seed is, and we have to understand what bruising his head is all about. Yeah? So run with me, if you can, to the book of Galatians. We're going to take a, a careful look at uh, what this mysterious seed is all about. Galatians chapter 3 in the New Testament. And when you're in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, please say amen. amen. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says, Now to Abraham and his what? And notice the S there is what? Is capitalized. A obvious connection to Genesis 3.15. Now to Abraham and his capital S seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ? So according to Galatians 3.16, who is that seed, that capital S? is referring to Christ. So in Genesis chapter 3.15, the second seed that we find there is talking about Christ. Yeah? What's the point? What, the point is that the first prophecy in the entire Bible is presenting to us that the focal point of every other prophecy that comes after Genesis 3.15 is not saying that the prophecy is about, uh, is merely forecast of future events, it's not saying that prophecy is about, you know, evil nations that will come and, and attack God's people, even though prophecy does include that. What is showing us that the spotlight on Bible prophecy is not really about a, an event as it is about a person. And who's that person? That person is Jesus Christ. Many times when we, when we interpret prophecy, when we interpret um, on prophetic uh, books, there are sometimes where it's so dry. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The prophetic interpretation is so dry. There's no, there's no strokes of gospel truth in there. And the point is that if prophecy, the first prophecy, is all about the seed and the seed is Christ, well, then that basically means that the focal point of prophecy is Jesus. And if in our prophetic interpretation, it, it, uh, our interpretation is void of Christ, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is our interpretation correct? Amen? Let me give you an example. Run over to the book of Revelation. Usually when we think of Revelation, we think of what? We think of beasts, right? Coming up out of the water. We think of lambs with, you know, seven eyes. We think of trumpets and, and you know, plagues. And we think of all of these things. Many, many people are afraid of the book of Revelation. Did you know that? I remember prior to my conversion, I remember watching a particular horror movie that in the process of the movie, it started quoting Revelation. I was like, ooh, that's scary. And I remember my mom had a little Bible. It was in Spanish. It was La Santa Biblia. And I was terrified of that little book because I knew at the end of that book, there was a book called Apocalipsis. And that just sounds scary, doesn't it? Apocalipsis. <laughs> doesn't it just sound scary? And when I watched the movie, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is scary. And then finally, when I had the privilege of opening Scripture, and I realized that, wow, the book of Revelation is completely the opposite of what I thought it was going to be. Right? Instead of being a book of terror, a book of horror is actually a book full of the promises of God. So the key is, if we want to understand what prophecy is and how do we see Christ in prophecy? This is one example. When you go to the book of Revelation, let's go to the first verse of the entire book of Revelation and see what the introduction is all about. Amen? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. When you're there, say amen. The Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, according to the introduction in verse 1, what is Revelation about? Notice it says the revelation of 
Jesus Christ. And actually, the word revelation in the original Greek means the unveiling, right? So when you see Revelation chapter 1, you notice that the first thing that it does is it shows you that the book of Revelation is not so much about events as it is about a person. Amen? And if it's the unveiling, well, then that must mean that the book of Revelation is focusing on Christ beyond the veil. Now, where do we see a veil in the Old Testament? In the sanctuary. And where was that veil? It separated the holy place, the most holy place, right? And, of course, there was another veil that basically introduced um, the entrance of the sanctuary. So, basically, this is sanctuary terminology, right? So, what Revelation is showing us is simply unveiling uh, the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, right? So, the first text of the entire book of Revelation points directly to Jesus. I think pretty much right now we're all in agreement. Let's go to the last verse of the book of Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22, and let's see what the last text in the book of Revelation tells us. Because if we can see the beginning mark of Revelation and the closing mark of Revelation, it helps us kind of understand what prophecy really is all about. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20, and when you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, what? Lord Jesus the last text of the entire book of Revelation, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What does the last text of the book of Revelation teach us about? It presents Christ. And not only does it present Christ, but it presents a returning Christ, right? Even so, come Lord Jesus. So what do we have so far? Well, the first verse of the book of Revelation teaches us about Jesus. The last verse of the book of Revelation teaches us about Jesus. Now let's go. Are you ready? Anybody, anybody want to take a guess what our third trip is going to be? We're going to look at the middle verse of the entire book of Revelation. We're going to look at what I like to call el ombligo of the book of Revelation. Does anybody know what el ombligo is? I know some of the Spanish people are chuckling because they know what I'm talking about. El ombligo is the belly button. Amen? <laughs> That's what the ombligo is in Spanish. So what is the middle verse of the book of Revelation? I'm so happy you asked that question. <sighs> because if you go to Revelation chapter 12, you actually find the middle verse of the book of Revelation. Anybody want to take a wild guess what it is? Revelation chapter 12, not verse 17. We've been reading Revelation 12, 17 quite a bit. It's actually Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 is literally the epicenter, the nucleus of the entire book of Revelation. Most assuredly, this text, the center uh, Bible text of the book of Revelation, must show us what the heart subject of Revelation is. Would you not say so? Well, then let's find out what, it, what it's talking about. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 tells us, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out. Amen? That is the middle verse of the book of Revelation. And what person do you see in Revelation chapter 12 verse 10? The Bible says that the power of His Christ has come. What do we have so far? The first verse of the book of Revelation talks about who? Jesus, the last verse of the book of Revelation talks about who? Jesus. And the middle verse of the book of Revelation talks about? So what do you think everything in between is really about in the book of Revelation? Jesus. When you think of the most prophetic book in the entire Bible, what do you suppose that book is? Revelation, right? Daniel and Revelation. Those are the two prophetic books. So the point is that if you notice carefully, when you look at Revelation, you realize that it's really talking about Christ. This is consistent with Genesis chapter 3, 15, which is the very first prophecy of Scripture. Genesis 3, 15 is laying out the foundational principles on how to interpret subsequent Bible prophecies. And the point is that, notice that Christ is all over the book of Revelation, and notice that in Genesis 3, 15, the seed with a capital S is kind of the focal point of it. Why? Because he's basically crushing the head of the serpent. 
So if there's any pro prophetic interpretation that comes after and it is void of Christ, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it biblically sound? Amen? So prophecy points us to a person, and that is Jesus. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 3.15, there is another element that we see. So in Genesis 3.15, one of the elements that we see is that prophecy is supposed to point us to the person of Christ, to the mission of Christ, and it's supposed to be redemptive. Amen? We should see the plan of salvation articulated in our prophetic interpretation, and I think that's how we do service to prophecy. Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, 15, the Bible says, And I will put what? Enmity. enmity. Now, what does the word enmity mean? The word enmity is used all over Scripture. Hold your finger in Genesis chapter 3, 15, and run with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 talks quite a bit about enmity, yeah? And it uses it in the context of the struggle. And it uses it in the context of differentiating between two different classes of people. Romans chapter 8, and when you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in verse 3 of Romans chapter 8, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh th that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Here it is. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is, what's that next word? Enmity against God, because it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You see that? So Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is using the same word, enmity, that was used in Genesis chapter 3.15, and he's showing that the carnal mind is at enmity. The word there, enmity, is basically communicating war, yeah? It is, uh, it is at opposition. It is in uh, battle. It is in controversy. So when the Bible says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, this is talking about strife. This is talking about a struggle. This is talking about the great controversy. So in Genesis chapter 3.15, the very, very first phrase that is articulated in, in the first prophecy is the concept of a struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. So prophecy, according to Genesis 3.15, is not only pointing us to the seed, capital S, which is Christ. Not only is prophecy supposed to be unveiling the work of Christ and His plan of salvation for humanity, but also prophecy, what it does is it shows us what's going on behind the scenes between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Prophecy is a VIP class, pass, excuse me, into the realm of spirituality when you see what's happening in the angelic world. Amen? And that's why prophecy is so powerful. And that's what Genesis chapter 3.15 uh, is basically showing us. So Genesis 3.15 shows us that there is enmity, that there is war between good and between evil. The Apostle Paul here shows us that there is enmity between the spiritual mind and the carnal mind. Yeah? And then finally, when you go back to Genesis chapter 3.15, what do you see? I will put enmity. There's the great controversy. There's war. There's struggle between you and the woman and between your seed and... <clears throat> Her seed, capital S, which we've already identified to be Christ. He, the seed, shall bruise your head. This is talking about the serpent's head. And you shall bruise his heel. So prophecy is ultimately going to unveil when Christ bruises or crushes the head of the serpent. What does this mean? The point is that prophecy unveils the final triumph of God and His people. Amen? This is the three layers of, of the first prophecy. Number one, it shows us, it unveils <clears throat> the truth of the great controversy. Number two, it shows us the seed. Yeah? Prophecy is all about detecting the seed, which is Christ. And then finally, it shows us when God is ultimately going to fulfill all of the promises that He made. Amen? So in Genesis 3.15, you have several things. You have a serpent. How many of you like serpents? Don't raise your hand. You have a serpent and you have a woman, yeah? 
and you have enmity between the woman and the serpent. Now, that shouldn't surprise us, amen? Because there's always enmity between serpents and women, amen? My mom is an avid enemy of serpents. So much so that if she sees anything that looks like a serpent on television, literally she will scream and she will attack the television screen and probably attack you, okay? So National Geographic doesn't work with my mother, okay? Or Discovery Channel. She just, she just cannot, she can't handle the snake thing, okay? So it shouldn't surprise us, but we see a woman, we see serpent, and then we see enmity between the serpent and the woman, right? And then we also see the seed of the woman, but not only that, we actually also see the seed of the serpent, yeah? And there's enmity in many, many different levels. So what exactly is this? When you look at Genesis 3.15, you see enmity between the serpent and the woman. You see enmity between the seed versus the, I'll call it the big seed with a capital S. And you also see enmity between the serpent and the big seed. Okay? So there's just a lot of animosity in this text, right? There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of beef. Okay? <laughs> when you look at Genesis chapter 4, it's very interesting because in Genesis chapter 4, you have kind of the continuation of Genesis chapter 3. It makes sense. And you have the struggle between Cain and who else? And Abel. What happened to Abel? What did Cain do to Abel? He murdered him. Now, why? He was jealous, right? When you look at Genesis chapter 4, and by the way, as soon as Cain killed his brother... God came to Cain. And what did God do to Cain? He started asking him questions. Where did we see God asking questions? Genesis chapter 3. Adam was asked three questions. Eve was asked one question. So when Cain sinned, God comes and he's investigating, right? And after he investigates, then he pronounces judgment. So when you, this is kind of like the, 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 the template of prophecy beginning all the way back from the book of Genesis. So when we look at Daniel and we talk about the investigative judgment, it really shouldn't shock us because that's the way that God has been handling a rebellion since Genesis chapter 3. He asks questions, he investigates, and then he pronounces judgment. It's part of God's plan for dealing with sin. Now, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25, the Bible tells us that right after Abel was assassinated, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son named Seth, for God has appointed another what? Another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. You see that? There's, there's that word there. There's the seed. Now, where did we see seed? We saw it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? There's a struggle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And the point is that once this prophecy was given in Genesis chapter 3, 15... The serpent was trying everything that he possibly could to destroy the seed of the woman because he knew that this seed that was going to come through the woman was going to be the one that was going to put his kingdom, the serpent's kingdom, to an end. Amen? So he did everything that he possibly could. We literally basically summarized the entire Old Testament. When you look at the struggle between good and evil in the Old Testament, it's simply the struggle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. That's all you're seeing, and it manifests itself through nations and manifests itself through judgments and through many, many different things. And that's exactly what happened. So God provided another seed through Seth, yeah? And when you read 1 John 3, 12, it actually tells us that the one who was behind Cain in killing Abel was none other than the wicked one, which is referring to Satan himself. So obviously what Genesis 3.15 is showing us is that to every battle, to every physical battle, there's a spiritual battle behind that physical battle. And that's how we have to kind of look at the Old Testament and the New Testament prophecies. And when you continue seeing throughout history, it makes sense why there are so many death decrees in history. Run with me to the book of Exodus. You're in Genesis. Run with me to the book of Exodus. And we're going to go to chapter 1 of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 13. And when you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. 
They made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra, and the name of other was Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on their birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall what? Kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives what? Feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. What do you see here? You basically see that there is a desire to take out who? All of the male seeds of God's people. Now, who do you think was kind of inspiring Pharaoh and his crew to carry out this edict? It was Satan. Why? Because remember, every power has a spiritual power behind manipulating and, and influencing. And the reason why the Egyptians were trying to take out the Hebrew male child is because the serpent in Genesis chapter 3.15, remember that through the line of the Hebrews, the seed will come and eventually crush his head. All throughout the Old Testament, that's basically what you see. You see that in Exodus chapter 1 and even in the story of Jacob and Esau. How many of you guys remember the story of Jacob and Esau? The two brothers, right? There was Esau that was inspired by the evil one, yeah, to come and to try to take out Jacob. Why? Because remember, behind the mind of Esau was who? Satan. Satan insinuating and inspiring to try to take out Jacob because Jacob, through, through Jacob, was going to come what? Was going to come the seed. That's basically what you see all throughout the Old Testament, and that's why Genesis 3.15 is a pivotal text in Scripture. Yeah? Jacob and Esau, we see this. Run with me to 1 Samuel. Another, another example of this is in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17, this is a famous story. We tend to read this to the children, children's story, but we tend to not realize that this could also be applicable for grown-ups as well. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and beginning in verse 47. When you're there, please say amen. This is talking about the showdown between David and Goliath. Anybody familiar with this story? I think we all are. Then all this assembly, in verse 47, shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck it in the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with him. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. So here you have Goliath and David. Now who do you think was inspiring the mind of Goliath? It's pretty obvious, right? Trying to attack David. Why? Because through the line of David was going to come who? The seed. Very interesting. Who won the battle? Little old David. Right? And after David wins the battle, he actually takes the head off of his enemy, Goliath. Isn't that interesting? When you read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where was the serpent going to receive his wound? In his head. Do you guys see the parallel there? So in every story in the Bible, you simply are seeing a microcosm, yeah, of the final showdown between Christ and Satan. And we could go on and on and on, but the point is that when you read every story in Scripture through the lens of Genesis 3.15, you will come to the conclusion, yeah, that there is a spiritual war behind every physical war and that in the end, ultimately, God wins. And that's the purpose of prophecy, is to unveil who wins in the end. And hopefully, by showing you who's going to win in the end, you will put your faith on the winning team. Amen? Amen. Revelation chapter 12. If you come with me to Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> we see in Genesis chapter 3 that there's a woman. We see her seed. We see that there's enmity. Yeah? And we see that there is a serpent. Well, when you read in Revelation chapter 12, you actually find all of these elements in Revelation chapter 12 as well. Amen? When you go to Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verses 3 to 4... 
The Bible says, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give what? Birth. What is another way of saying this? Basically, the woman was about to deliver the seed, right? Her seed was about to be born. To devour her child. So the dragon was trying to devour her child as soon as it was born. Why was the dragon trying to devour her child? Because he knew that through her, the seed was going to come and finally crush his head. She bore a male, ch a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So here you have the dragon trying to attack Jesus. Now, how did the dragon attack Jesus at his birth? What power did he use? Herod. And what did Herod do? A death decree to take out all of the male children. Does that sound familiar? We just read that in the book of Exodus. You see that? It just literally repeats itself. Because the devil is trying to do the same thing over and over and over throughout every epoch of Bible history. And he fails. He does not succeed. So when you look at Revelation chapter 12, he fails at an attempt to attack the seed. So because he cannot attack the seed anymore, who does he take his anger out on? The woman. You see that? And not only does the woman have a seed, right? But also we, we read that the serpent also has a seed. And in this particular portion of Scripture, the seed of the woman is none other than the man-child, which, of course, was going to rule with, a, rule with a rod of iron, which is referring to Christ. Well, who do you suppose the seed of the serpent is? If it's not Christ, it is Antichrist. And that's why all throughout Scripture you have God's people, the woman in the wilderness, yeah? And you have the beast power trying to kill the woman. All you're basically seeing is an unfolding of Genesis chapter 3, 15. That's all you're seeing over and over and over and over again. So you have the serpent, the woman, and the seed of the woman. And then Revelation 12, 17, that's why the, the, the dragon is wroth. Because remember, there's enmity, there's beef, there's controversy. And the devil knows that he has short time before his time is over. I want to read a fascinating Bible passage to you. Run with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16. Because even though we know that in Genesis chapter 3.15, it's talking about Christ, yeah? And it's kind of the picture that you have, of course, is that Christ is, is about to step on the head of the serpent. And in the process, of course, the serpent bruises the, the heel of Christ, but immediately after, crushes the head of the serpent. Well, I ran into a text that, that really, really intrigued me in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, and when you're there, please say amen. amen. Verse 19. For your obedience, the apostle Paul says, has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Now listen carefully. And the God of peace will crush who? Satan. Does that sound familiar? Will crush Satan. But notice what it says. Under who? Under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So we saw in Genesis chapter 315 that, that the seed, capital S, was going to crush the head of the serpent, yeah? And was going to basically take him out. But the Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 16, God wants to fulfill the prophecy of Genesis chapter 315 in the life of his followers. Amen. Amen? Question, when was it that Jesus successfully crushed the head of the serpent? When was it that the serpent bruised the heel of Jesus? At Calvary, at the cross, right? Jesus says, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. And he says, the prince of this world is judged. And he's referring, of course, to, the, to Satan himself, that at the cross, Satan was no longer, yeah, had the opportunity to go to heaven and to represent planet earth. Because now, at the cross, Christ became the rightful ruler of planet earth. Amen? So Satan was confined to planet earth. But of course, the, at Calvary, we're talking about AD 31, yes? We're talking about something that took place 2,000 years ago. Is the serpent still alive, yes or no? He still is. So the question is, when is Genesis 3.15 going to be fulfilled? Ultimately. Romans chapter 16 tells us that God wants to ultimately fulfill this prophecy 
with his believers. There's three casting out of Satan. Satan was cast out at heaven. He was cast out at the cross. He was confined to planet earth. And finally, by the grace of God, he will be cast out of the heart of God's people. And in Romans chapter 16, we're told that God wants us to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And God, the God of peace, will crush Satan under our feet shortly. Somehow, God is going to use his people to vindicate his character. Amen? And the same way that God was able to be victorious over the serpent was going to Calvary, yeah? Because at Calvary is where you have the most amazing, the most outrageous picture of the love of God. One preacher says that, that the proof that the Bible is inspired is Calvary. And he says, because no sinner could make up such a beautiful story. And it's true. So when you look at the cross, when you look at Calvary, what you're seeing is the most beautiful language that heaven could communicate to fallen man to basically communicate how serious God is to fulfill the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. But the, the point is that the way that Christ was able to crush the head of the serpent was at Calvary. Unfortunately, the serpent is still roaming around. Amen? And he's still creating havoc on the people of God. So the million-dollar question is, how do we finally see the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy in the book of Genesis, come to fruition? If it was at Calvary where Christ crushed the head of the serpent and Romans 16 tells us that God wants to crush the head of the serpent under your feet, where do you suppose we need to go in order for God to crush the head of the serpent under our feet? We need to go to Calvary. Amen? God is wooing his people. Genesis 3.15 is a promise of what Christ is going to do at the cross, but it's also a promise of what God is going to do in your life as his follower. Christ wants to use you, amen, to finally vindicate his character. The only way that we're going to be able to accomplish this is by coming to the foot of the cross. The, the serpent is still alive today, and it's not until God's people embrace this prophecy, take it to heart and say, Lord... I want to see this prophecy fulfilled in my life. How many of you today want to see Jesus? I want to go to Calvary, and I want you to crush the head of that serpent under my feet. Raise your hand.